to uh, first of all welcome here um, our long-serving economics professor uh, Philip Robbins uh, and uh, his wife Susie at the front here. Uh, Phil, can you stand and take a bow for a moment? So, um, Phil is uh, the very uh, Phil and Susie are the very proud father and mother of Jason Robbins, our next guest. So. Um, I want to reassure all of the alumni here that we don't just leverage the alumni, we also leverage our faculty. Uh, so um, just very briefly, uh, Jason is the uh, chief executive officer and co-founder of DraftKings, which was founded in uh, 2012 and is the leading uh, fantasy sports uh, provider in the United States. And um, he uh, graduated from uh, Duke University, but of course uh, grew up in, uh, in this area. He has a number of major accolades uh, in the 40 under 40 list uh, from Fortune Magazine, the Sports Business Journal, and uh, the Boston Business Journal, among others. Um, what we're going to do is a slightly different format for uh, Jason. We're going to have a face-to-face uh, -face, uh, fireside chat interview and uh, interviewing Jason is going to be Rolando Aedo, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Rolando is a uh, MBA in International Business from uh, the University of Miami. And uh, he was born in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, but came very early uh, to Miami and uh, has uh, had a tremendous uh, career in many public service roles in the Miami area. So we're very appreciative, uh, Rolando, of you sparing time today as well. Uh, let me invite both you and Jason to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Left or right? Okay, I'll, I'll be here on the left-hand side. So, uh, so I have the uh, the privilege, actually, of not only addressing all of you and thank you, Dean Welsh and and Roni from development and Enrique. Uh, I've had an opportunity to kind of re-engage with my alma mater. Hopefully, you guys uh, do it uh, every day because it's been a, a true privilege and pleasure to not only live in this community most of my life, but be associated with this institution. Uh, it's, meant, it's meant a lot to me personally and, of course, professionally. I can uh, honestly say it's been one of the reasons that I do what I do at, the, at a high level. I don't know if uh, you know too much about our organization, and I won't spend too much time, but the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau is the organization that brings meetings, conventions, major events to our community. In fact, uh, next week we'll be with NFL. They're in town. They have a it's supposed to be under the radar screen, but I just spilled the beans. So the whole NFL crew is in town as we're planning for the 2020 Super Bowl. Uh, we, we set it up that way for this, for this day, of course. But, uh, so they're in town. We, we are the ones that put together those bids for major events. Uh, we're working on everything from World Cup soccer in 2026 to NFL to the Democratic National Convention. Uh, so those are the things that we do kind of behind the scenes. Um, as, the, as the dean said, I've uh, I've been here most of my life. I, I don't li live too far from here. I've got two kids, a little bit older than uh, I think Jason's kids, and it's amazing how well rested he looks. He's got a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and an infant. But I think that's because grand the grandparents are helping out a lot. So <laughs> I know I couldn't have done it without my uh, my grandparents. So so yeah, it's it's you know one of the things that we'll talk about, and and, and this is a fireside chat. Does anybody does anybody know? Does everybody know where fireside chat uh, fireside chat comes from? We don't count. <laughs> yes, FDR, the infamous fireside chats back in the 40s when he would address everyone on radio, no less. So uh, this will be a, a more progressive version of that. But um, you know, one of the things that I know was covered in his bio, and uh, some things that weren't covered in his bio are, are how did Jason get started in this amazing, uh, not only company, but industry that, that is as big as it is because of him. And one of the little anecdotes that was shared with, with me was when he would spend a lot of time with his parents reviewing all statistics of sporting events. And I believe you guys would then quiz him. And, if he, and I guess if he didn't answer correctly, he didn't get breakfast. Is that how it worked <laughs> out? But, uh, 
But I, I think it's all those moments in your life with loved ones that really inspire you to do the things you do. So um, I want to turn it over to Jason and kind of give his perspective, not just on, on his family, but obviously this amazing uh, baby that he's uh, uh, cultivating called uh, FanDuel. So with it, uh, I'm sorry, DraftKings. <laughs> yeah. I wanna, wanted to make sure he was paying attention. So Jason. Uh, well, I guess a good starting point is just I grew up here and um, you know I was a huge sports fan as a child. In particular, I was a huge University of Miami fan. I think I missed maybe two or three games between the ages of four, which is the first one I ever went to when I graduated from high school. Uh, I used to go to a ton of basketball and baseball games. I played at Ron Frazier's baseball camp. And the highlight of my athletic career was I, I made a double play at Ron Frazier's baseball camp. I caught a ball, and then the person who was on second wasn't paying attention to run. I ran in and tagged the base myself. And Ron Frazier actually gave me an award and said that was a heady play. Um, and I think what he was really trying to say is for somebody with no athletic skill, wow, you really <laughs> used your head on that one. Um, but that was the peak of my, my athletic career. I quickly learned I was a little bit better at the stats and business side, and as you mentioned, I used to love this back in the days of newspapers, um, all, reading all the box scores in newspapers, and when I could you know, get them to, I'd ask my parents to quiz me on those and uh, try to memorize the stats. So I, I always loved sports, and my entire childhood here, um, those memories were really built around the University of Miami more than anything else. And uh, you know, several years later, after I finished up college, I went and worked in, uh, at, a, at Capital One at an office in Boston. And, um, after that, I worked at Vistaprint, and uh, through those two experiences, I met both of my co-founders. And uh, I was still a huge sports fan, and I started really, um, you know, everywhere I went, I would start the office fantasy league. So they knew I was into it because they were in the fantasy league with me. And one day, one of my co-founders, Matt, brought to me this idea, and he said, "Hey, uh, I think that we've been tossing around Matt and I and Paul as my other co-founder." ideas, or probably you know, 50 plus ideas we'd thrown around, because I had the itch, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, and none of them really seemed right. And then when I heard this one, it was like instantly it clicked. I said, I think this is it. Um, so I went and I got Paul involved, and we started doing a little research, and I looked online, and sure enough, there, this wasn't a new idea. Yeah, FanDuel and about two dozen others were already doing this. So. First, it was a little bit disconcerting. I thought, oh no, we're, we're too late. But then I, I realized I'm about as big a fan of fantasy as it, as, it, as it gets. And if I hadn't heard of any of these things, maybe it's still early enough. And if we do things a little differently, maybe we can still be a major player in this market. So we started working nights and weekends for months and months. We would almost every night after our day jobs go over to Paul's house. He lived in Watertown, Massachusetts. And we would take over his spare bedroom and work till many hours of the evening. And then same thing on the mornings of Saturday and Sunday, we'd wake up around like six or seven, uh, sometimes eight, because we need a little extra rest. And we'd go and work the whole day there. And um, you know, basically between that and our day jobs, working over 100 hours a week. So it was, it was pretty brutal. But eventually, we got to a point where we had enough to go raise some money. We went out and raised uh, uh, a little bit of money from VCs, quit our jobs. And the ride kind of started from there. You know, you're, you're renowned for your ability to raise money, and uh, I think a lot of the folks in the audience perhaps might be in similar <coughs> situations, trying to build up their organizations and uh, identifying whether it's VC firms or angel investors. Uh, tell us about some of that, because I'm sure a lot of the folks would like to know what, what makes you so good at raising money, spending other people's money. <laughs> Maybe I'm better at spending it, I don't know. But, uh, perhaps. I, you know, I, I think it's really its core is sales pitch. And just like anything you'd sell, you have to figure out who your audience is. You have to figure out what's going to resonate with them. Um, you know, and you have to make those points. And I think there's much judging you at the first stage. Obviously, as you get farther and you have a real business, they look at the business and they look at the metrics of the business. But when you're doing seed stage fundraising, I mean, we had nothing. We didn't have a live product. We had a PowerPoint deck. and an Excel file and you know, three, three guys at our day jobs. And um, I think, by the way, we probably broke every cardinal rule. Like, you're not supposed to be at your day job. You're supposed to actually have a product. I think if we were trying to do that now, the environment's changed a little bit. It would be impossible. They want you to have a little more traction now. So a little bit was luck. Um, but you know what, what happened was, and I, I learned all this along the way because I just at first would talk to anybody. I didn't have any preference on angel investor, VC, 
whoever I would talk to, and I wasted a lot of time on people, because everybody will take a meeting. Nobody doesn't take meetings. Some don't, but most do. Um, you know, I was pitching people who were like investing in solar energy projects and stuff, and one day I went back to this VC who had said no to me, and I asked him, what am I doing wrong? I think always asking for advice is good, and um, especially if somebody's already turned you down, it's really got nothing to lose going back and asking for advice. So I went back, and he's like, well, who are you talking to? And I told him, a bunch of people, and he's like, wrong person, wrong person, wrong person. I said, what do you mean? They're investors, they invest in startups, don't they? He's like, look at what this person's invested in, solar energy, he said, solar projects and sustainable energy. Is there anything that looks even remotely like what you're doing? And I said, no. Um, he's like, well, okay, like, why don't you talk to people who are into what you're doing? So the person who eventually he, he uh, referred me to uh, happened to be a big sports fan, big fantasy sports fan. His name's Ryan Moore. He was at Atlas Ventures, now called Accomplice Ventures in Boston. He was a college football player. So, I mean, he had a passion for the subject matter and for the space. And uh, I think getting to the right investor who's going to be into what you're doing is absolutely critical. And then the rest is just, you know, any sales, you know, sales pitch uh, it would tell you, you know, understand you know, what your key points are. Don't talk past them. Like, you don't have to answer questions that they're not asking, because sometimes you're going to throw something out there that'll spook them that really didn't even need to say. Um, and, you know, I also think there's an element of just persistence and not, not being discouraged when you hear no. We were said no to by 50-plus, uh, uh, and that was just that fundraising round. I mean, if you total them all up, I've been said no to by hundreds of people. And you just kind of got to keep rolling. And some of them were tough. I mean, there were ones that brought us back in for like three, four visits, and we really thought we were going to get them there. And then they said no, and it can be crushing. But you just got to move on. You can't think too much about it. And I'd say that's a general rule for startups and business in general, but especially startups. If you get too caught up in the ups or downs, you're not going to make uh, create a successful business. You just have to stay steady. And um, I think that's been particularly true of us, but really at any startup, there's big, big highs. The highs are really high and the lows are really low. And you just got to kind of stay with your vision, stay consistent, obviously react to what you're seeing, but don't let the emotions ever get too, uh, play too much of a role in how you're thinking about things and don't get caught up in good and bad things that happen. You know, a lot of the folks in the room I, I either are sitting in C-suites or are aspiring to sit in C-suites and, and you've built this. So I, I guess by default, you've always been in that C-suite along with your co-founders, but Share with some of the, uh, the, the students and the prospective uh, CEOs of tomorrow some of your insight as, as you go through this process, not only running a company, but starting and forming it as well. I was fortunate in that, because um, I probably would have tried to start a company out of college, but I say I was fortunate that I graduated right after the bubble burst, and that really wasn't an option. Um, so I actually went and worked at two companies, uh, Capital One and Vistaprint, before I started DraftKings. And not only did I learn a ton, I also met my two co-founders and a number of the original people that we hired. So that ended up being a really, really good thing. And I think I would have failed if I had tried to start out of school. Now, I never had a C-suite or even close job at any of those. I mean, these were my first two jobs out of college. I was originally an entry-level analyst and then you know, middle manager by the time uh, I started DraftKings, but never got to any incredibly senior level. But I did get some experience. I knew how to manage people. I knew how businesses operate. I understood how to use data and analytics and how to set up systems that you could rapidly test and iterate. Um, my co-founders as well, I met people who rounded out my skill set, so I knew how important it was to have a technology uh, or uh, a, a technologist as a co-founder. Um, that's something I think if you're in, I mean, it seems obvious, but I can't tell you how many people ask me, oh, do I need a technical co-founder? If you're in the tech industry, yes, you do. Unless that's you, you need a technical co-founder. Um, a lot of people don't think so, though. They think they can just hire into it. I believe that's absolutely critical. Um, and these are all things I learned by having some experience in, in business and, and at good companies, too. The companies I was at, Capital One and Vistaprint, mm -hmm. well run, really smart people. They were also really, really, both of them were more than most this way really uh, into using data and analytics to make decisions, which is core to how DraftKings operates as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, Vistaprint really kind of disrupted that, that printing business yeah. using technology, digital, uh, and I think obviously uh, so did your, you know, your organization as well, and that's been one of the differentiators 
that's what allowed you to accelerate that. You know, the digital space that we're all operating in, even in tourism, um, you know, some of the uh, biggest brands in travel are truly technology companies that happen to be selling travel. Um, tell us a little bit more about how digital, even through your uh, lifespan and, and the company has evolved and how you're further leveraging it. So probably the biggest thing um, that's changed is mobile. When I was at Vistaprint, which was very strong on the digital side. Not only did they have amazing technology, they layered this incredible direct marketing engine that was all analytically driven on top of it. When I arrived there, they were spending over $100 million a year on all digital. Most of it was at a first order or, or shortly thereafter payback, and it was all rapidly optimized using the systems they built. So I had a really good understanding of how to set those types of things up. Um, how to architect our initial database and structure it in a way that would both allow us to get the data we wanted now, but also be flexible as we added more complexity to the product. All of that and getting that right early on is incredibly important. Um, but when I was at Vistaprint, almost no one had a smartphone. I mean, this was like not that long ago, but uh, you know, people don't realize that 15 years ago, no one really had a smartphone. It's, it's uh, so big a part of our lives now, it's hard to imagine it was that recent 10, 15 years ago, but nobody did. And so Vistaprint really wasn't a mobile company. A lot of the same concepts apply, and similar to Capital One. Capital One, when I was there, was not a digital company, but how you do analytics, how you set up tests, all those things are the same at the highest level. Um, but there is a lot of specific subject matter around what types of channels you use to acquire customers in mobile, and. Um, the technology side is quite different in how it works from, from digital, um, and that was something we really had to learn because now about 90% of our customers uh, use our mobile app, not our website. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, and, and even in our industry, 60%, it's not 90, but 60% of the folks that are engaging uh, in our business, travel, tourism, convention, are doing it on our mobile platform. And, and I bet five years ago it was like half it, of that, right? It, it was, it was. It was literally about 30%. So yeah. it's, it's increasing exponentially. We'll be at 90% soon. <laughs> um, so, so thanks. You know, again, bringing it back to, to, to this campus, and I know you're not a cane by, by credential, but you obviously have a strong connection with your parents. Um, tell us more about that. You know, growing up, your affinity for the school, what it meant to you directly, indirectly. Uh, I mean, I know it's special to me. I was, here, I was here in the 80s, and if you can imagine, for those of you that remember, that's when UM football went through this roof. Uh, my classmates were Michael Irvin, Alonzo Highsmith. Uh, I wasn't a very well-disciplined undergrad, um, but thankfully I came, up, came back as a grad student. So kind of relive some of that and your connection to this, uh, to this school. Uh, I'm still a huge Canes fan. I mean, that, that's just never going to change. I love, I love the Canes. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the 80s, so very similar experience to the, uh, you probably, uh, you know, from a different lens because I wasn't in school with those people, but I was watching them on the field, and how could you not get into it? I mean, it was just such an amazing thing. This team was unbelievably good. They just always, uh, Florida State, you know, or Notre Dame just seemed to have all the, the big teams' numbers. and. Um, had so many amazing rivalries to watch, and they had this swagger about them, which, you know, I know had some good and bad, but everybody, the, the whole U episode on ESPN, like, I mean, that, I remember, when I was watching that, it just brought back so many memories, and um, I just fell in love with the, the whole University of Miami uh, swag, the U, and everything about it then, and uh, it's kept up. I mean, even now, the turnover chain, everything, it just sort of all fits together with that same culture that I remember from the 80s when, uh, I guess it started with Howard Schnellenberger, but my first memories were really of the Jimmy Johnson years. And um, that was my first really love uh, experience with sports. And I, you know, my father, uh, college professor here, my mother and father and I used to go to the games together. And, there's just so many memories of, of childhood, of playing baseball with my family at Mark Light Stadium when you know, we'd get a, a couple extra hours after the camp ended and my dad could throw the ball around and play catch with me. And I just have so many great memories. And sports is, uh, I think, something that for me has always been uh, a huge hobby, but also something that with all my loved ones I've really shared and it's meant a lot to me from that perspective as well. So growing up in the southern part of Miami, went to Miami Killian for high school. Yeah. I believe he went off to uh, Duke uh, for, uh, for college. And you know, I know one of the things that uh, I had the pleasure of meeting one of your colleagues, Eliza, that works in your PR. She went to Michigan. And what are you looking for when you're trying to 
select team, um, team members. I'm sure that you want folks that are going to further support the, the success you've seen, but what are some of the attributes that you're specifically looking for? We just need more Elisas. Where's Elisa? Where's Elisa? Uh, there she is, right up front. Yeah, there she is. So, um, you know, she's great and I think very uh, representative of, of what we're looking for. Uh, you know, first and foremost, um, we want people who are really smart and really, you know, dedicated to what they're doing. You have to have a high level of commitment to be at a startup. We're not early startup, but we're still very much a startup in our culture and mentality. So. Um, you have to have that attitude of it's not a nine to five job. It's something that really, you know, you're going to pour a lot more than that into. And um, you're probably going to be doing something that you're the only person in the company that can be relied on to do it. So, um, you know, that's big responsibility, which I think is different than working at a large company, but also something that requires a pretty heavy level of commitment. Um, we also want people that are collaborative, that are nice people. Um, we have a, a, a no a-hole policy. Um, and, you know, it's one thing, I think, to be driven and passionate and to push to get things done. Um, also to be candid, not to hold back on feedback. All of those things we, we not only um, allow, we, we encourage, we want that. We want what we call radical candor. Uh, in, pre in giving feedback and, and expressing opinions, but it has to be done in a collaborative way. It has to be done in a respectful way. Um, and people have to work together and they have to value that it's important to work together. And that's something we really look for and test as well. Um, interestingly, everybody asks me this, but being a sports fan is not a critical thing to, to working at DraftKings. In fact, we want a mix of different types of people. Um, you know, diversity comes both in uh, things like race and gender, but also for us, you know, background and interest. How many people came to DraftKings because they're really into sports versus they're really into technology versus they just want to be part of a disruptive startup. And having people who are there for different reasons and bring different perspectives and don't necessarily look at it through the lens of somebody who would be a customer is very helpful. Uh, and then the last thing that, that I would say is that um, we are a very analytical company, um, very data-driven company. So. Um, we, we look for people who are comfortable using data to make decisions and who embrace a culture and, and a, a model where data really drives the decisions. And, um, you know, it's nice because the data is the ultimate dispute settler. It's not who has the loudest voice. It's not who can make the best arguments. It's what the facts say. Uh, and that's how we make decisions. So what's the future of DraftKings? Do you have how many employees uh, globally? About 650 right now. And, and what, what does the future hold? What would you like it to hold, I guess, better? <laughs> well, I think for us, it's a very exciting time because about four and a half, actually, no, at this point, five and a half months ago, uh, there was a really big Supreme Court ruling, which, um, in effect, what was happening before was outside of Nevada, states were basically banned from legalizing sports betting. So the law never said it's illegal, never made sports betting federally illegal, um, kind of an odd one. They could have done that, but they didn't. Instead, they said no additional states can change their laws. So that's why Nevada was still allowed to do sports betting when the other states weren't. That law was recently overturned and held unconstitutional in May by the Supreme Court, which has now opened up uh, the states to kind of do whatever they want in this area. So the first one to move was New Jersey. Several other states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Mississippi have now also passed laws. So it's going to be a huge growth, uh, a source of growth for us. Um, we launched our, our first sports betting app in New Jersey, August 1st. Um, what's good and bad, I guess, about being in this type of regulated market is they publish your and all your competitors' results every month. So the last month that came out was September, and we had 67% share of the online market for sports betting. I don't think we'll stay that high, because it's early on, but we were off to a commanding lead. We were almost uh, three, over three times uh, our next closest uh, competitor online. And so um, I think that's going to be a big part of our focus. And of course, we're going to continue to invest and build out our fantasy sports offering. Um, that's going to be a big part of what we do for forever, really. Uh, and then lastly, we've also begun investing in uh, the media and content side. We think there's tremendous synergies between uh, content and, and, uh, and the games themselves. Uh, if you look at traditional fantasy sports, season-long fantasy sports, all of the big players are media companies, ESPN, Yahoo, CBS, NFL. 
Um, so obvious synergies there, that's where we acquire our customers. That's also the content people consume. They're watching the sports and reading about it when they're playing our games. So we think there's a ton of synergy there, and that's something we think we can get a lot of value out of building. You mentioned traditional sports. While we were waiting for this session to start, I shared with Jason, I have a 16-year-old son who's into uh, video games and eSports, and that's oh, yeah. taken off. We actually hosted in Miami just a few weeks ago a big eSports conference, and it sounds like you know, you're getting into this space as well, correct? We have fantasy esports now. Fantasy um, e yeah, so our view That's is a fantasy of a fantasy, right? Well, it's a sport. <laughs> esports, you know, any it's anything that has spectatorship, we believe, can be translated into a fantasy game. And um, you've even seen like ESPN, because you know Disney owns them in ABC, which had the Bachelorette. They had a fantasy Bachelorette game that they did last year. So kind of expanding beyond traditional sports, but esports is obviously a huge category. I mean, it's 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 funny because like. It seems like only over the last few years, people are like, huh, that's big, but it was massive before that. It's always been a big category, and I think it's just starting to get the attention of the mainstream. It's just starting to get picked up and put into broadcast form more. Obviously, Twitch has exploded in the last few years. So the spectatorship of this is really, it's real, and it's not going anywhere, and it's growing. Um, so we want to do the same thing we do with traditional sports. We want to create fantasy games. Hopefully, we'll be allowed to do uh, betting uh, in, in most states on eSports, although New Jersey uh, in their initial law did not allow for eSports betting. They, they thought it might be uh, something that would appeal to children. So um, that's something we gotta watch out for in the other states, but we'll do whatever we're allowed to do and we think it's a huge category and one that we wanna be a part of. So speaking of children, I, uh, I think I already mentioned this, but you've got perhaps your greatest accomplishments uh, in addition to DraftKing. You've got a four, two, and, a, and an infant. Want to share some uh, some uh, some uh, stories about how being a young father and how that impacts your overall work life balance? Uh, you know, one of my investors, uh, guy Yuri Milner from DSP, when um, he was investing, and uh, at the time, um, I, I think I just had my first one. He said to me, uh, "When when you do a startup, you have three things in life: your business." and then you have kids, your family, and your friends. You can only pick two of them. Um, so I don't have many uh, chances to spend time with friends anymore. I've basically given up my social life is the short answer. And um, I think that, you know, for me, the business is, is number one, not because my family personally isn't, but because I feel I took on a responsibility to my investors who've given me capital to the 650 employees we have. And I think it would be selfish not to put that number one. Um, but my family is pretty much 1A, and I think everything else is a distant third or fourth or whatever behind that. Um, and I try to spend every waking moment I can that I'm not working with them. Um, and you know, one of the nice things about being uh, in the type of position I'm in is, you know, I'll be here randomly on a Friday or doing travel and different things. So you can find opportunities when you do that to squeeze in different hours things in with your family. So for example, I may have to work on a weekend one day, but there also might be a day where I can get home at two o'clock in the afternoon and you know, take my kids to the playground before. So I try as much as possible to find times that I can just really dedicate to them. And um, my wife has been on me for this. I'm not quite good at it yet, but putting my phone down is something I'm really focused on. I'm addicted to my phone with uh, you know, answering emails and texts and um, I'm making a sincere effort to try to put it in another room. So even if it rings or something like that, I'll, uh, and of course that stresses me out, so I always go check it every two seconds, but I'm, get, <laughs> I'm getting better at it. Um, you know, but it's hard, it's hard. And I, I think that you just have to figure out uh, how to do the best you can at it, but recognize that it's not gonna ever be a perfect balance. And at least for me, I'm always gonna feel a little bit of guilt that I'm not spending enough time with my family, but I made a commitment, and I think there's no looking back, no, no second thoughts about it, and there's something comforting about just accepting that and not, not stressing or agonizing about it, and um, at least now that's where I'm at. Terrific. In a few, we'll open up for a couple of questions, but I, I was out there, and hopefully a lot of you saw these coasters, which I thought was a great idea in terms of thought starters, so when I looked at my table, I saw, what did you learn from your first job? So I'll, I'll, I'll say quickly what I learned, but I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to set it up. But you know, one of my first jobs was a bag boy at Publix, which, as you know, is a local supermarket chain. 
renowned for its customer service. Uh, where shopping is a pleasure. I think we all know that tagline. Uh, of course, my most vivid memory of Publix is after hours as we were you know, cleaning up the place and stacking up the paper towels into bowling pins and taking the frozen turkeys and, and sliding them down on the aisles. And of course, we didn't tell anybody that. But, <laughs> so, but what I did learn from my first job was customer service. And, and you know, taking out those bags and, and even though we weren't allowed to take tips, they had such a strong commitment to that. And, and I think that is something that has served me well in any capacity in any organization. What about you? What did you learn from your first job? Uh, well, my first job ever, or my first real job, uh, was uh, scooping ice cream at a Haagen-Dazs in the Dayland food court. Um, <laughs> I think I was 16, 15, 16 when I got it. And the biggest thing I learned was responsibility. The reason that I took that job was I wanted to have money that I could go and um, my parents made me pay for my own insurance when I got a car. I had to, you know, pay for my own uh, nights out when I would want to go out with my friends, and um, I give them a lot of credit for, for teaching me that responsibility, but I learned you got to work if you want mm -hmm. things, and um, I think I also learned a little bit about customer service, too. It, you know, nothing like uh, being in a food court to, you know, uh, see some strange characters that, that come up to the counter. Um, but you got to treat everybody like their most, your most important customer. And I, I think I learned that primarily from the person who ran the shop, who very much infused that into everybody, that every customer is important. Treat everybody like your most important customer. And that's something I've tried to take with me to DraftKings as well. Great. Well, I know we have a few minutes left. I think about seven or eight minutes or so to keep us on track. Five minutes. We have five minutes. The dean says five. It's five. <laughs> so. Um, I think we probably have time for two or three questions. I know there's a mic floating around there, but this is a small room if you want to. Hi, I had a question. Uh, when you guys initially got your seed funding, specifically being a gray regulated area, how much of importance did you have of you spending a lot of money in legal fees? Is that something you guys, because uh, you can be, with a small amount of money, you can spend a lot in legal fees and not be able to launch. So how important was, uh, how did you allocate funds for legal fees and stuff like that? Um, so I don't know that this is the best advice. I'll tell you what we did. Um, we didn't do much in that area. We had some very basic analysis done, and it was enough to get the investor comfortable at seed stage putting in money. And we said, you know, we're going to really leverage what others have done. We looked at the fact that there were 25 others in the marketplace. So we borrowed things from their terms of use, from their you know, uh, various, you know, the privacy policy, all of that. I mean, we had a lawyer review it, but we really tried to write a lot of that ourselves and save legal fees. I think if you can save legal fees, that's money you can invest in your product and marketing and other things. And it doesn't mean that you don't do it in some places, because you have to, but um, we wrote our own incorporation docs. Like, we really tried to save there. Are you concerned with the changes in viewership and attendance at professional sports and how that might affect DraftKings? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's a double-edged sword. Um, the short answer is yes. I mean, if sports viewership is growing, that helps our business. So that's a good thing. Um, but I say it's a double-edged sword because it actually has a really positive effect too. The sports leagues, for the first time ever, um, and if you had asked me five years ago if this were going to happen, I would have told you, absolutely not, you're crazy. They all want sports betting now. They all want to see more gaming in sports. And they love us, and they love what we're doing, not only in fantasy sports, but on the betting side. I mean, this is you know, deep-seated stuff they, in these leagues they've been against for years and years. Uh, and now they've flipped. And I think a big part of that is they understand that the engagement, the young audience it attracts, and those things are critical uh, to the future of their growth. So, you know, yes, I want more viewership, but also I think our relevance and importance to the sports leagues, the media companies, and the overall sports ecosystem would not be as high as it is if it weren't for that. Final question, that's it? Yeah, I, I think, think we're all set. Well, I think we're wrapped up, but let's give Jason a big hand for coming out from Boston. Thank you. You did great. I appreciate it.
Thank you. Um, so, la ladies and gentlemen, let's give uh, Jason another round of applause. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, congratulations to uh, Phil and Susie as well. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, do a quick shout out, if I may. We have uh, uh, today the benefit of having uh, several of our prospective MBA students for uh, the coming year with us on campus. And I think there are. Uh, five or six of them here in the room. Uh, are you out there somewhere, candidates? Ah, here they are, right here. So um, what we try and do every time we hold one of these events is uh, make every event do double or triple duty. So hopefully uh, all of you are really enjoying uh, the opportunity to see the Miami Business School in action today. And notice everybody, uh, we don't have three guys and one lady in this group. Can you stand up and just let them see the type of wonderful people that we're uh, bringing into the school? So we, we hope very much uh, to see you all uh, this coming year uh, in the MBA program, and thanks for joining us today. I'll now hand over to... Uh, Vice Dean Cronquist again to uh, moderate the afternoon faculty panel uh, sessions. All right, we have another set of uh, fantastic uh, faculty speakers uh, lined up here now, uh, representing a, a few different uh, interesting fields of, uh, of research and uh, knowledge. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shalom Saar. He is the Samuel N. Friedland Executive Management Professor of Professional Practice. Uh, he was also very recently appointed our Associate Dean for Executive Education. So he's going to be the driving force behind growth in our executive education uh, offerings. He's, uh, held, uh, he, he has his uh, PhD uh, f in uh, organizational behavior from Harvard, and he's held appointments at many different schools uh, around the globe, including Harvard, MIT, here in the US, uh, at CIBS, CKGSB, and Shanghai Jaitong University in China, where he most recently came from when he joined us this uh, summer. Dr. Saar believes that uh, leadership is not just something that you're born with, but that is something that can be uh, nurtured and that everyone has the uh, capacity to, uh, to learn. So he's uh, dedicated his career to uh, training leaders, CEOs, top management teams to identify and cultivate their leadership uh, skills. So as you will uh, experience now yourself, uh, for us to add someone of uh, Dr. Sars caliber to Miami Business School's faculty uh, is, is a great, great pleasure. So uh, I would like to welcome onto the stage um, my colleague and friend, Shalom Sar. Well, it's a great honor to uh, stand in front of you here. Uh, but before I really start with the quest for leadership, let me ask you a question. When you think of leadership, or when you think of people who influenced you the most, what adjectives come to mind? Anyone? Don't be shy. Go ahead. Integrity. Uh huh. Keep. Huh? Character. Gen generosity of time. Keep going. Reliable. Mm, okay. Vision. Uh huh. Keep going. Now, you see, if you really listen carefully to all the adjectives, then there is a really critical question. Why most organizations don't have leaders that are gifted with these qualities? Why are we overmanaged and underled when, in fact, any common person will give you a definition of what leadership is? 
I know it when I see it. And yet we struggle with this concept. And we know that in the end of the day, leadership comes down on how we lead our families, our schools, our organizations, and our countries. It remains the most mysterious topic, most researched and least understood. So what I would like to do with you today is to kind of whet your appetite to what leadership is all about because I'm a great believer that leaders are not born. They are made. They are made through disappointments and setbacks, through failures, and throughout of those experiences, leaders learn how to lead. The issue of leadership, I like to bring to your attention five concepts before I get into the real topic. I started this idea of leadership as a naval cadet. I grew up in Israel, a country surrounded by enemies, very small population, and yet survival is a critical success factor. And later on, I was given the opportunity to lead the Naval Academy. I had to confront this idea when we interviewed young women and men, how can we predict that in fact they have the right stuff? And once we selected them, what do we do in the course of four years to intervene and to make sure that once they go out there to the real organizations or navigating ships, how are they going to make sure that they do the right thing? So leadership for me has five critical elements. So number one, I talk about leadership with the small L. Most of us, you will learn, you listen to Orlando and Jason, that really what they confront day in, day out, is the issue, how can I lead my team? I'm a great believer that there is no such a thing as a good team, a bad team, or a tired team. Only good leaders, bad leaders, and tired leaders. And so we are fascinated by leaders with the big L. And yet, day-to-day -day life, we are really focusing on the leadership with a small L. How a woman like Alex Willock, who took the Miami Herald from bankruptcy and transformed it into a wonderful newspaper in Miami, one of the best newspapers in the country. How a woman like Blanca Ripple, you heard of her today, how can she, after 33 years, get up in the morning with great deal of energy and leads her team to make sure that the events and meetings run seamlessly? This is where my interests lie. How Gene Smith, who just graduated from the business school, goes into an organization and learn how to mobilize her people. This is where I believe all of us face. And so I am a really great believer that if we understand the leadership was the small L, it makes us really appreciate what we do day in, day out. When you listen to Jason's, he is looking for people that leadership with the small L runs from the receptionist who picks up the phone before it rings to the top person. How can we lead across the board? Number two, leadership is really about mobilizing people. 
And you cannot mobilize people unless you touch their hearts. And for so long in most business schools, we ignored the heart. We ignored the role of emotions in organizations. In fact, we discouraged the whole idea of emotional realm in organizations. Still, you heard this morning with Marie that emotional intelligence, maturity, composure, empathy become really critical in mobilizing people. You cannot mobilize people unless you touch their heart. Sure, you have to engage their mind. Sure, you have to engage their imagination. But you must touch their hearts. Because once you do that, you can take them to any battle. Number three, leadership is not a random act. This is a critical element. You don't just act the way you feel like. You had a fight with your spouse, you go to work, and you say, let me dump it on the people around me. So leaders, from the moment they walk into their office, they must be very conscientious of how they come across. A question I used to ask many of the CEOs at MIT when they came to a week or two weeks long training, do you know the name of the person who cleans your office? And to my surprise, hardly 10% raised their hands. In my response to them, you are not a complete leader. Because if you ignore the people who do the simple tasks, the routine tasks from cleaning the office to serving you food, if you don't pay attention to them, how in the world can you expect them to perform? And so this idea of knowing how you walk and talk and interact and greet people becomes a very important quality, very little researched. And number four, it is a journey. Take Steve Jobs brilliant, who changed the world, transformed the universe. And yet, he was very incomplete individual. He may rest in peace, but he was a terrible human being. <laughs> Ignored the mother of his child, even called one of his products Lisa. Kicked her out of, her, of his office when he was worth $50 million. He was oblivious. He was rude. He had no respect for people. And yet he was transformed due to two events in his life. One, he faced mortality. When he learned that his days were numbered, that was a wake-up call for him. And two, met an incredible woman that learned and taught him how to really appreciate life. And when that happened, Apple rose to a greatness that you see today. So leaders don't become overnight. We learn through trial and error, through disappointments, through being fired, and I will talk about it a little bit more. And Finally, there is a great deal of academic research if leaders are born or are mad. In my point of view, who cares? Who really cares? When you are in charge of a team, it matters not if you were born or you were mad. You have to confront the reality and learn how to do the right things. And so this leads me to what I believe five circles that really create this idea of what leadership is all about. And one is know thyself. Most leaders, most executives, let me define them as leaders, most executives don't know themselves. In fact, let me submit to you that most of us don't know who we are. Not because we are bad people, but because we don't have time 
So we are bombarded with tasks. Professors are bombarded with publishing and research and teaching and having families as executives, as managers. We are all busy people, so where in the world do I have time to know myself? So knowing oneself is absolutely critical. In a wonderful book that was totally overlooked, published in 1982 by the only psychiatrist at Harvard Business School by the name Abraham Zaletsny. He wrote a book which I really recommend called The Managerial Mystique. And the greatest aspect of the book, he said, basically, good leaders are twice born. First, they are assigned to the leadership, from being a dean to being a division head to being a team leader to whatever it is. And then you face difficulty unsuccessfully. You're fired. You're demoted. But the real leader digs in. Why was I fired? Why was I demoted? And as they do that, they really kind of bang on themselves. And in the process, they rise from the ashes and are reborn as leaders. A very interesting concept. I have coached hundreds of executives and CEOs all over the world. And this is really an important quality, the gift and the courage of really knowing who you are. I think quality two is, there's a CCL, the Center for Creative Leadership, that in order for us to become better leaders, better parents, better at what we do, we must take the time to reflect because the process of reflection leads to process of learning, and learning leads us to change. And so I strongly urge you to find the time to take a pause, to reset your mind, and to reflect on what went well, and most importantly, of what did not go very well. The courage to confront oneself, and you heard from Marie this morning because if you are aware of yourself, it is a prerequisite to regulate yourself. We all get upset. We all get angry. But when we express it in public, when we express it at home, we lose far more than we gain. Can we sublimate that anger, which is most common, it's, it's, it's justified. Can I sublimate the anger to a more positive force, to be more composed, to be more empathetic, to be able to listen? So this idea, it takes a courage to confront oneself. Know what drives you. Know what are your hot buttons. Know what are your driving forces critical in knowing oneself. So to sum up on this element, knowing oneself is a prerequisite to a good leadership. Sun Tzu, in a wonderful book, I don't care for the title, The Art of War, it was written 2,400 years ago in feudal China, and said, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you will never be in peril. And the question I ask often my students, who is the enemy? Can you answer, who is your enemy? Yourself. Most executives I coach, they are their worst enemy. They shoot on themselves, you know, and foot many times over and don't learn from the experience. So this idea of knowing oneself is really, is, has been old and critical to the process of transformation. Frances Hezerbein, a wonderful woman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, took the U.S. Girl Scouts and transformed it into an incredible organization because she saw the demographic changes happening in the United States. And that is the North. This is what I call the true North, having a clear vision. You heard it a few minutes ago from Jason and Orlando. 
to have a clear vision. Without vision, we perish. So this idea of having a clear picture, a vision is a dream. A vision is a passion. It is a fire in the belly that gets you up to do what you do. Once the passion is gone, from my point of view, life is over. It becomes really just mundane. I did some research of why m marriages break down. They break down usually mid-age crisis. Why? The empty nest syndrome. And all of a sudden, they look at each other and they don't know what the vision is anymore. And so this idea of passion, the fire in the belly that drives us, it is what Thomas Aquinas once said, the prime mover. And so you have to look what is your passion, what drives you, because once you have the passion, it enables you to fight, it enables you to have the courage to touch people and to drive that vision. And the vision at times is swimming against the tide. It's not easy. You have to battle coalitions. You have to battle resenters. You have to battle diehards. You have to confront. It does not come easy. But the resiliency and the ability to overpower and not to be frightened by those who will oppose you really drives the passion. Confronting setback and failures because, as you already heard, Failure is your best coach. Success spoils us. Failures teaches us. And we should always remain flexible, nimble, agile, in light of whatever difficulties. We don't blink. This is the real prerequisite for the second uh, element of leadership, which is a vision for yourself. I love Ofra, who came from nowhere, nowhere, small neighborhood in Baltimore to create an incredible empire. I don't have any limitation of what I think I could do or be. What a powerful statement. And another one by Steve Jobs, I want to make a ding in the universe. This is our role. This is why we are on Earth is to make a ding on the universe. It's to make the life of other people better. Leaders take people to a place in which they cannot get there by themselves. And the third one is managing tasks. And God knows we are very good at it. We learn at business school accounting and economics and finance and marketing and all the things that make organizations go. So it means we need to know the terrain. We need to be technically competent. We need to chart out a roadmap. We need to focus on details. And we need to aspire to really operational excellence in what we do. Now here is what I call the barrier and the trap. Because we become so good at it. We know I need to be a good accountant. We know I need to really understand the financial statement. I need to have operational excellence. Otherwise, the organization goes belly up. But yet, we pay so much attention to this that we ignore the next one, which is focusing on people. Here, where my research shows that most of us are not very good at it. We pay so much attention to the task, so much attention at making things run, that we ignore the people's side. What is the people's side? Can we really make people believing in themselves? Can we touch their heart to get them to a place in which they can be far better? We don't know how to do this. People tend to be liability for most of us, dispensable, ignored, 
And yet you cannot go to the battle unless you really people feel that you believe in them, that you care about them. Listening, a great quality of leadership. We all learn how to talk. PPT and presentation skills are important. But do we really know how to listen? To listen to the silent voices. The Chinese character of listening consists of three elements. Listening with the eye so I can see the pain. Listening with your hear so you can hear what people are not telling you. And listening with your heart, which is really emotional intelligence, the ability to empathize, the ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes and empathize with that person. And when you do that, and it is genuine, it comes from your heart, you're not faking it. People respond. And it is universal. It is in China, in Germany, in Saudi Arabia, or anywhere else, that the leader must be able to listen. And listening is a rare quality. And let me just add to it that we live in a very lonely world. We live in a world where we're all clicking. I was in a restaurant the other night. Couples were sitting next to each other, and they were clicking. Just clicking, not looking at each other. And I say, why are you having intimate dinner in this restaurant? It really puzzles me. And so we are stopping to communicate. We don't know anymore how to probe and how to listen. This is an important quality of leadership. If you don't have the compassion, if you don't care for the human condition, you cannot lead. You can manage. You can run organizations by fear and intimidation. But you cannot lead. Because the first opportunity people have, they will resign or they will check out. So this idea of compassion, of caring, it is a critical quality of leadership, universal. Miami is a great example of diversity. In, I have lived in San Francisco. It is a very diversified city, but the, steer, the, the path has not been steered. Each layer of ethnic group but no mix. But when you come to Miami, it's an incredible, viable city where the cultures and languages and customs really come together in a beautiful manner. And so leaders don't appreciate, don't tolerate, pay attention to the word. I leverage diversity, leverage diversity. Take advantage of the diversity because the more diversified the team becomes, the more creative the organization gets to be. Time is the best gift leaders give. I often ask the CEOs, show me your calendar, because calendars don't lie. And if you see that the CEO or the division head Whoever the person in charge put people on her or his calendar, that's leadership to me. Because that's the opportunity. It's the opportunity of the gift that I put a person on my calendar and give her the time I listen, I empathize, I coach, I mentor and guide. And finally, these are great ones. Be strong, be extremely kind. And above all, be humble. One of my favorite coaches, Coach K, turned down an offer of $40 million by the Lakers to stay at Duke for $750,000. Not a bad salary, but to turn down $40 million because he said, I want to be where my heart is. And my heart is with the students here. And this is something you will see in this school. I have been here for four months. The dedication of the faculty towards students, I have not seen it, let me tell you this, I have not seen it at Harvard. 
a faculty that is totally dedicated because that's where leadership really exercises itself. And finally is what I call live by your principles. I put it in the center, it's the moral code. I think you said it earlier, the first person said integrity. Your character is your trademark. Once you really compromise on your character, you lose the trust. And once you lose the trust, there is no way you can mobilize people. So the idea of knowing what your character is, and it is a journey, and to make sure that what you say you mean, and you mean what you say, and you follow on your promises, that is character, because leaders, once they lose the trust, they cannot mobilize. Be nimble without compromising. And I see it very often, people compromise on their principles. And when do we do that, when we compromise on our principles, which at times we do, we become unhappy at our hearts. Because we know, we look at the mirror, and we say, I don't like you. This is critical. And when a leader compromises, he or she loses trust. Speaking truth to power, I add the word grace. So I can go to my manager, I can go to Paul and say, Paul, I have been working for you for the last 10 years, and you have been a great leader. However, there is one thing that I really need to share with you. And that is, where am I heading at this school? What is my career path? The ability to really tell somebody, you have a bad temper, and that temper is really destroying the team. The courage to tell somebody, maybe there is no fit between who you are and what this organization is trying to be. Jason struck me as that kind of individual. And finally, be consistent. Character you cannot, it's not to be traded for the highest bid, is to do the hard and right versus the easy and wrong. Run to the fire. It's a great line. And one of my favorite and good friend, General Dev Palmer, who ran West Point Academy, revolutionized West Point Academy by, being, by saying, I don't need the officers. The seniors will train the juniors and the juniors will train the sophomores, and the sophomores will train the freshmen, because that is the real test uh, of leadership. Do the hard and right versus the easy and wrong. Any questions? Or comments? Don't be shy, I know you are Digesting? Yes, sir. I think uh, as a society, we're going south here. I am very worried about where we are. I chose U.S. citizenship by choice because growing up in Israel, we always admired the U.S., admired the democracy, admired its heroes, admired what it stood for, admired the Constitution. But as a society, we are splitting. Worrisome, worrisome. So, and I think political leadership has to unite. Regardless of your political view or any party you vote, in the end of the day, the role of a political leader is to unite the people. And we are not there. So I am worried. And many people worried like me. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you are, but as a society, there is a lot to worry about us. We're being mocked in many other countries. Yes. Uh, the back there, the back. Rob, just, yeah. Yes, uh, Shalom. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, two things that stood, stood out to me. You said leadership is something that can be learned. Uh, and you also mentioned that um, failure is a way to learn 
and to pick up leadership. Um, as a school, how do we teach leadership, especially in the, in the sense of we're not really going to be putting our students into positions of failures? Uh, actually, uh, we do. I can tell you, I teach a class on leadership. The first, the first class, before I say anything, I give them a simulation in which I know they will fail. They actually go through the simulation, and the big egos, you know, rise. I got it. I know it. I know how to solve it. And they take over, and they fail miserably. And then they're all embarrassed, usually men versus women. I did this at the Kennedy School of Government. How much time do I have, John? Zero. <laughs> Working for John, it's always zero time, you know. <laughs> so I should stop here then. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it's less about John and more about the next speaker. Is a respect for the next speaker. But the point I try to make is that we develop simulation to really make them fail. Uh, Patricia Arbel is not here. She teaches a course in negotiation. She has a simulation in which they fail. Out of the failure, then there's the debrief. And out of the debrief, what did we learn? So yeah, I think we do, and we should do more of it. Simulations teach leadership. Leadership maybe can, I believe that we can teach leadership. That's what I have done all my life. But I am convinced that it can be learned. It can be learned. One more question, then we go. Yeah, yes, sir. Brief. We don't. The reality, we, we don't, because what we do is performance, 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 and less about how to lead. And how to be, uh, very briefly, I take the class, split it into two groups. One group, I go into this room, the other one goes to the other room, I say, come up with the 10 elements of leadership. Come up with the 10 elements of followership. Do you want to, get a ge to take a guess, what do we get? Huh? 80, 90% similar. Mm. To be a leader is to be a follower, a good follower. We have not done a good job at the school system teaching followership and leadership from an early age. Thank you so much. All the best to you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, now it's working. So thank you to uh, Dr. Saar. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it was a very natural choice to uh, appoint him for our school as our leader of uh, executive education. So many of you represent organizations where I'm sure there are some uh, issues related to uh, leadership and leadership training. So do keep us in mind and our team, uh, Dr. Saar's team, to, uh, to engage with your organizations. Now, for the uh, next speaker is um, Dr. Uh, Yongtao Guan. He is the Leslie O. Barnes uh, Professor and also the Chair of our Management Science Department. He's also the Director of um, uh, the uh, new Deloitte Institute for Research and Practice in Analytics, DERPA. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD in Statistics from Texas A&M University and he's a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Prior to joining our school, he was a professor at Yale University. Uh, Dr. Guan's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, NSF, and also the National Institute uh, of Health, NIH. 
And just a few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Guan and two of his faculty members in his department, they were the recipients of the inaugural Dean's Appreciation Award for their absolute dedication to a superb student experience for our Master of Science in Business Analytics uh, students. So please welcome Dr. Yongtao Guan. Okay, thank you. So thanks for the introduction, Henrik, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give this uh, talk something related to what I do as research. So the title of the talk is Location Intelligence in a Digital World. So firstly, what is um, location intelligence? Location intelligence or spatial intelligence. So basically, it is uh, the process of deriving useful, meaningful insight from spatial data or geospatial data to solve a particular problem. So there are many different kinds of spatial data, and you can think about, for example, Google Map, though that's something about spatial, or data you collect from a satellite, spatial, or it could be you're using your cell phone to call a Uber, you know, that's also something about spatial data. The first application of spatial data actually goes back to the 18, uh, uh, 54. And, and so on August 31st, 1854, there was a major outbreak of cholera in the Soho district of London. And, and for that particular outbreak, there were more than 600, yeah, 616 people died. And so the disease nowadays we know is passed by a bacteria called a vibrio uh, cholera. And at that time, people did not know that. So the, the bacteria can be passed from uh, the next human uh, to, to have the disease through water. For if you drink some contaminated water, there might be a risk. At that time, people did not really know that. They thought it was because of some noxious air, right? So there was a physician at the time, and his name was Dr. John Snow. And he thought, well, it must be something from water. It may not have anything to do with noxious air, as people say. So how do we convince people, and especially during the outbreak, how, does he, how could he reduce the disease outbreak? What he did is something very simple, but also very clever. So on the left-hand side of this picture, the, the slide you would see, this is Dr. Zhang Snow. And on the right-hand side, that graph is a network. And you may imagine this is a road network. There are some dots, some, some black points. So what are those points? If you zoom in, Actually, you can see, well, this is a network with some locations. Of, you saw some solid circles. Those solid circles are the location of water pumps. And it, at that time, people would go to the water pumps to get a water supply. It's not like we turn on the faucet, we get a water now. And, the, and next to the points, if you see there is one street, it's called a Broad Street. Uh, and there's a water pump, a circle, and you see some uh, parallel ticks next to the, or surrounded by, sur uh, surrounding the water pump. Those are each single parallel tick corresponding to a disease incidence. So the height of the bars, you basically, what you're seeing is the number of disease incidents that occurred at that particular location. Okay, so how do we use this map to, to draw something that would have help or understand what might have caused the disease. Well, there are other water pump locations, and you can see, well, there is only one particular water pump on Broadway, and on, at that particular Broad Street, at that particular pump, there you see the cluster of disease. If you move further away, you see another water pump, maybe, for example, on the lower, on the top right corner, the top left corner, there's another water pump. There's no disease. Actually, you go back to the regional map, and, it, it, and you could see, so in the center, that corresponding to the, the one on the Broad Street, and everywhere else, you don't see the clusters, you don't see the diseases. So Dr. John Snow simply say, well, because of what we observe, I highly suspect that it's really because of water that causes contamination, causes people to be sick. 
So what should I do then? Well, he suggested to the local government that you should uh, remove the water pump handle and from that particular pump. And the government did that. And since then, the disease count dropped dramatically. Of course, there are other reasons, as Dr. John Snow argued, could have caused that, the, the decrease in, term, the, in, in the number of incidences. Uh, but but that, that one factor, one action that he took, certainly contributed greatly, as we later know more. Dr. John Snow, actually, he did further study uh, after the disease outbreak. And he was able to find really the water that that particular water pump supplies were taken from a contaminated portion of the things. Okay, it's really because of that that caused the outbreak of the disease. So this study do conducted by Dr. John Snow was considered as the founding event of the modern day of epidemiology. And it is also considered to be the first application of location intelligence. So now moving to the digital world that we are in, we have more location data. So location data are become more prevalent than ever and more complex than ever. And there are many examples we are all familiar with. And for example, if you are going to a different city, you book your airline tickets through Expedia, or if you use Airbnb, all these transactions we are doing about locations. If you use Amazon to buy anything, the product will be shaped to your home address. So this business, they know where you're going, where you're staying, where you live. So this is some information we are giving away. There are other information we are also giving away for exchange of convenience of using the technology. And for example, if you're using Google Map, or if you're using Uber, you're using Lyft, all of the three are heavily location dependent. So we are willing to give away this information in exchange of the convenience the technology can bring to us. We are also using social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, right? If you use Facebook, you check in the restaurant, you are giving away your location. And if you use WhatsApp to let your friends know where you are, you're giving your location, okay? A lot of the times though, we are giving away the location to the ones that we thought we are giving to, but this location can be used by other people as well, okay? I had my new iPhone, I was setting up my iPhone, there are so many apps. Whenever I first time use the ask me, do you want to turn your location? Do you want to turn your location? I become very conscious because I was preparing for the talk. I tried, I always say no. Okay, but if I said yes, and they are gonna use your location data all the time. So every business, you know, every app you use, they may wish to collect your location. And if you're running a business, you know, just one thing, one example you can think of how you can get, obtain location data. If you buy something, the customer buys something online, they need to supply credit card information. Associated with the credit card information, there is also home address, okay? So you can easily collect all those locations. But the question becomes, what do we do with these locations, right? What can these locations, what can location intelligence do for our business? There are two different kind of analysis we can quickly think of. The first one can be simply understand about our customer, understand who they are, why, where they are, and if you wanted to do further analysis by associating with the locations with some additional information, we may try to understand why they are who they are, where they are. And knowing this information certainly can help you greatly in running business. And for example, we have two, we have some, if you're running a sports franchise, you wanted to position your stadium at a location where that's gonna best serve your potential customer, the fans, right? So we have two sports teams. One is uh, their soccer team, so they are coming back to Miami. So where are they gonna place their stadium? Okay, knowing who the fans are certainly is gonna play a critical role, but they don't have data. But if you talk about uh, the other sports team, we have the Florida Panthers. We did a lot of work with them. And they have collected years of data of where the customers were. And they are also in discussion on possibly switching to a new stadium, right? So knowing the back informa the information from the past customers, if they want to pick the location for the next stadium, how do you leverage the knowledge to make more intelligence decisions as to where this is going to be? So this is going to be huge, right? So this is the one form application. If you collect location data where your customers are, this analysis would be relevant. 
The other type analysis would be do marketing, location-based marketing. So if the talk of today, I'm trying to focus on the first part, but if you have time, I could go over two examples. And these examples like are for Whole Foods and Barney's New York, and they did a lot of location-based marketing. You would hear, hear the word geofence, or you would hear the word geo, uh, geo conquesting, and geotargeting in general. Okay. So, so I'm going to focus on the first talk, the first part of the talk, uh, uh, the topic. So this is based on some capstone project of students in the Master of Business Master of Science in Business Analytics program. And we worked on capstone with the Florida Panthers. So the Panthers collect all the location data of their customers. Either the customers were season takes holders or, or, or just single, team, single game holders. Okay. So this customer's data, because they buy the tickets online. So as a result, they know where they are. They need to supply the personal information. Okay. So the students were tasked to create an interactive map and to realize the customer locations. And by playing, by placing the locations on the Florida, South Florida map. Okay. So what are the tools that they used? Well, they used the analytical tool software called R. So R is a statistical uh, software. It's a free and a very powerful. And it can be used to acquire, manage, and analyze data. Among the many functions that it has, it can also be used to handle spatial data. So what are the different um, ways it can use to handle spatial data? Well, if you have customer locations, typically these come in, in the form of addresses. You may want to convert them, for example, into latitude and longitude. You can do this using R very easily. Okay. You may also want to know some information about the neighborhood the customer is in, and you can use the census data. You can use R to extract census data to obtain information, for example, the average income, median house value, um, age, etc. Okay, and if you wanted to know, well, what about the at the personal level? You know, this person you want to have some information about how wealthy, for example, or, or the economic condition of this person. Typically, you can't collect this information, but knowing the address, you can go to Zillow, for example. And if you want to do it just by yourself, you put in the address, you can see, well, what is the property value, tax amount, et cetera, and so on. Okay. So we can collect this information very easily if you want to do it by hand, but if you have thousands of addresses or millions of addresses, you don't want to do that. Well, R can do that automatically for you. Okay. And in this example, you may also want, you may, it's also pretty clear the distance, the driving distance from a customer's address to the stadium would also matter, right? And using Google Map through R, we can extract that information as well. So a lot of useful analysis can be done. The most important message that I have for you, for everybody is, everything here is free. You don't need to spend a penny. The software itself is free. The packages are contributed by others for free. And Google Map and Zillow, you can have interactions with this, uh, this, uh, th this platform through R. And you can do that very easily, seamlessly. As one example, if we want to extract information for one um, uh, fan, and this, this person, I mean, uh, you know, let's say the person's name is Jack, okay? And this person lives, happened to live on Edgewater, an Edgewater Drive. I, I try to not disclose too much information, but just have a, 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 a picture from the sky of where the residence is. Whoever live in that particular building, I'm sure he or she would recognize this is where he or she uh, lives in. Okay. So knowing this information, I can write a few lines. Okay. There is no need for us to dig into the lines, but these are some R codes that, uh, that we wrote. Our students in the program, they wrote codes like this. Okay. So, so this code, what can they do? Well, you can extract information, you know, the ones that I mentioned, and you can see, I see somebody smiling, okay? Uh, and that's Edwater Drive, okay? And the estimate property value is over $2 million. Uh, well, I wish, uh, you know, I had a property like that. Uh, uh, enough said. And the census track median income is $127,000. And you can also see the total distance to the stadium is about 40 miles. And you can also see 
uh, the total travel time estimated by Google is about 49 minutes. For every customer you have, right, you can have this information very easily. You can have certainly have much more. And, and using this map, actually, you can also display, for example, the picture. In the first version of the talk, I had my colleague, Doug Lehman, and he helped me prepare the talk. He actually showed the picture of the person who lived at this address. But I think this is related to what I'm going to discuss at the end, at the last page of the talk. And there's also the privacy issue, right? And we don't want to disclose too much information. Uh, so, so that's why I, we don't have that. But nevertheless, the point is, any address you put in, you can extract information like this very easily, okay? In just a couple of lines. You have thousands, hundred thousands. It just takes a couple of seconds for you to get all the information for all your customers. Okay. So we can do so for every customer. We can also do so for all the customers and also for the regions the customers are from. The pictures that you see here, and you can see there are a uh, first picture on the right, on the left hand side, uh, that's the driving time. The cold color blue means it's closer, okay? And the warmer color red is, means it's further away, okay? So, so what you observe here is the cold color actually extended further along some major highways. If there are some major highways, even though it's much further in terms of actual distance, but in terms of driving time, it's not that far away. Okay, you can visualize the distribution of the driving time very easily. The second picture simply shows this is the average median household income. This is the median household income for every census block or census tract, whatever being displayed, being, being, being shown. The third picture shows this is the average age and the last picture, this is the average number of children each household has in this neighborhood. And you can easily see there are some areas that might be of interest. For example, is there a pointer? If you see the top, it, near the lake, near, near the lake on the top left, and you can see that's a very dark area, and they're corresponding to a neighborhood that has high median household, in, household income. And if you look at the look at the, uh, the age and look at the number of children, you can see the age actually probably around 40, 50, 40 maybe, and the number of children, the color is relatively on the uh, greater side. Okay, that simply tells you that particular neighborhood tend to be families, and the income level of people living in that area tend to be much higher than in other areas. If you look at the, the one right next to it, if you look at the third picture on the top middle, and you can see some dark area, that corresponding to age, okay? That simply tells you in that particular neighborhood, those are probably, there are gonna be a lot of retirees who live there, okay? So by visualizing these graphs, without showing any of the information of your customer, to give you some ideas as to what are the different factors that may influence where our customers are? What are those going to be look like spatially or geographically, right? Of course, we can also overlay the dots, the locations, on the maps. And to what we see on the left-hand side, that's simply overlaying all the season ticket holder locations on the map. And the second picture gives you the single game, some of the single game ticket holders. And the third picture gave you the all-inclusive package buyers of the season tickets. Thank you. And the fourth picture corresponding to the all-inclusive, the all-inclusive uh, uh, package buyers for single games. Okay. So by looking, by visualizing these pictures, you can, we can easily have some, I have some, have some first feelings about where the customer will be coming from. Of course, you're going to see clustered around, you're going to see clustered around the, uh, the stadium. So the stadium, you see the symbol, uh, that's corresponding to the stadium location. They're going to be, the more, the closer to the stadium, the more customer you're going to see, okay? And you're also going to see for the location of the customers that are going to tend to, especially that become more evident if you look at the last two pictures. And you can see, well, most of the all-inclusive package buyers 
they tend to come from neighborhoods that seem to be more affluent, right? So the picture that you see here could be because the eating household income is higher, which is shown by the third picture, or could be the fourth picture, this is the median house value. Okay. So these are the factors just by looking at this graph. These are the impressions that you have. What you would like to do is to be able to have a new customer. Given the features of the, where the customer is from, given the features you can extract for this customer from these fe features, you want to ask how likely, if he's not a customer yet, he's going to become my customer. Right? And, or if he's already a customer, he bought a season tickets, you want to see, well, how likely he's going to renew the next year, given the spatial information that we may be able to collect from the customer. Well, we need to build some model for that. And I want, I'm not going to go into how do we do that, but I want, just want to highlight that may not be something so easy to do. Because although you may tend to say, well, it's really because of income, it's because of the household value. But these factors, many of these factors, they interact with each other. They are not independent from each other. And we can certainly expect if you look at the income, you look at the household value, they're going to be related. You may, you may want to say, well, the more house, the more average income is, the more property value will be. But not necessarily so. If you look at these two pictures, if you look along the coastline, okay, if you look along the coastline, you would see some spots where you're going to see the second picture, you can see along the coastline. So these values, the house values, they're all pretty high. But if you go at the, look at the same locations, look at the median, look at the income levels, and you can see, well, the income levels may not always be high. The reason could be because, well, there are a lot of retirees live along the coast, okay? So does not really, they, they do not have income, okay? Or not much, or not much income. So as a result, reflect from the first picture, it's going to be low. But you look at the values, they're going to be actually high. So this is really not just a positive correlation, one high, the other high. It could also be one high, the other low, right? And there is for good reason, for reasons we can understand. Indeed, if you look at the third picture, the third picture gives you idea about the average age that tells you, you know, that is it likely to be have some, uh, you know, um, older people or younger people in this area. And you can align, you can see the ones that shows high median household values versus low, uh, in, uh, together with a low median income household. And the, the age corresponding to that particular spot is gonna be high, okay? For the reason that I described. And the other factor we need to consider when we do the analysis, we also need to consider the population density. And there are more people, so clearly you expect to see more season ticket buyers or whatever tickets or customers that you're going to have. So my point here is we need to build a model, and the model may not be that straightforward. It may not be as simple as we would like to conclude, simply say, well, it's because of household value, because of median income, because of age, or because whatever, right? So there are some sophisticated analytics that need to be involved in order to build the model. How much time? Okay. So I think it's a good time to wrap up. So I'm going to skip uh, the next couple of slides. So these are slides for you do location intelligence by uh, you know geofencing or, or geoconquesting or geotargeting. It's really applications in marketing. Okay. But to summarize, I also want to highlight the challenges with the location intelligence. Well, the first the first challenge is. Location data are very easy to collect because of the technology that we have. But real consumer permissions are hard to get. You know, as I was saying, I got my new phone, I set up the services, there's so many apps asking for my permissions. Do I really want to give away my locations to whatever app or, or browser they may track my locations? And most of us would say no, right? But the problem though, very often we may give away this information without knowing that. Or we turn the location on at the time we thought it would not be a problem, but later on we forgot about it. And then your location is being tracked, you know, by the app, by, the, uh, by Google, by Facebook, you know, uh, they know this information. So we may know that we are being tracked. We may know that we are, 
our information being shared. Okay. And the next thing we may realize when we're playing, for example, you know, any app like uh, social media or Angry Birds or whatever, and then all of a sudden you get an app that pop up, you know, and that's something may indicate that's happening. And for a business, it's very important not to be intrusive and not to annoy your customers. You can displace as, ma as many as, as possible, but to some extent, if the customer is feel really bothered, he's gonna go out of his way to figure out how to turn the location service off. Okay. And how do you display the right product to the right people at the right time at the right location? It requires a lot of thoughts. It requires a lot of careful work. It requires analytics. So analytics has to play a great role in this process. So with that being said, thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's a good question, right? Um, and for the application that we considered, so we have the location data for all the customers except those who buy the tickets at the ticket counter, right? So for those, I probably would not think there is going to be a significant difference between these two groups of populations, right? But I, I do understand for for the, your point that if you are uh, you know, you're more conscious about sharing the location or not, it turn it off, the results may be different. But from a business point of view, well, they just want to attract more customers in, right? Regardless, you turn, you, 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 you know, that would cause any systematic difference or not. Anybody nearby the location, you send information to them, it's going to increase the likelihood for the person to come to the store, right? So from a scientific point of view, if you want to say there's any difference between those two groups, yes, there's possibly. But if from a practical point of view, for a business operation point of view, uh, well, maybe that's uh, whatever they can get is better than they don't have anything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Guan, uh, who is uh, extremely hardworking, even among all our hardworking faculty members. I think uh, Yong Tao, he uh, normally had the track record. It's Friday today, so only another eight hours today. Okay, <laughs> keep that in mind, please. Um, and it's not only because of the research he presented, but his dedication to recruiting students and placing students in the business analytics program. Thank you. Um, now, the, uh, the next speaker is um, Dr. Andrea Yusun. Uh, and Dr. Yusun, she uh, received her PhD from uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. She was born and raised here in Miami, and she's been a professor uh, at our school since 1982. So you've been around for a while. Yes, indeed. Uh, and she's a globally recognized uh, real estate uh, expert. Uh, some of you may have had uh, Professor Yusun when you were here, uh, uh, and she was teaching uh, real estate. She's been um, uh, presenting her... Uh, research at more than 100 academic conferences around the globe uh, and she's been doing extensive consulting as well in all different areas of real estate. She's our academic director for real estate programs and she also manages our real estate advisory board and in addition to that she's engaged with a lot of different student initiatives including the so-called student managed investment fund which manages a substantial amount of money under supervision of our faculty members, but by students, and they try to beat uh, the returns of financial markets, and then the proceeds go back to uh, student initiatives. So um, uh, Dr. Yusen is a beloved professor here. She is uh, one of my mentors here, and um, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce her as our last faculty speaker for today. She is a true symbol of the philosophy of Miami Business School of Students First. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. If I cannot tell if the mic is working loud enough. Yes. Perfect. I also can't tell what happened to the clicker, which is uh, up here. Always good to have your tools. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
Let me just do a little bit of introduction while we work with technology. At least we're past the days of, of clear slides on overhead projectors. I know today's theme is technology, thank you, and it is so great to see so many friends. I see students, I hope that I will make new friends, and so many people who have come back to see what's happening at the business school, and I hope you like what you see as you move around the building, and also what you've heard today from some of the faculty here. What I would like to talk about, I think that real estate is one of the more interesting investments you can find. And as a finance professor, I was trained in efficient markets theory, where everything is priced correctly. And now, having spent several years in real estate markets, real estate is one of the few markets where efficiency might not hold as strictly as it does in the stock market. It's just a very different kind of investment. And I know some real estate investors start out in buying single family houses or condos and renting them out. And dealing with the calls at midnight from your tenant saying the plumbing isn't working and get over here. Um, you want to move into commercial? Usually the way most smaller investors start is by buying shares in real estate investment trusts. And those are you know, listed on exchanges and you can buy and sell them fairly easily. Well, one thing technology has brought us in commercial real estate is crowdfunding, which allows direct investment in commercial real estate projects, either development projects or rehab type projects. And if you just Google real estate crowdfunding, that's the first page you see. Now, you know it's a popular topic when on the first page the top three entries are ads. There's about two million entries here, so it'll keep you busy looking through all of these, but as you go farther down the screen, there are some opportunities to direct, to invest directly with real estate developer, real estate private equity investors, and it's those investments, those types of investments that I want to talk about today, because the size and the accessibility of those investments are something that make them accessible to ordinary investors. So direct investing, you have to, in commercial real estate, you have to deal a little bit with terminology. The investment itself has risks and rewards, and like all financial assets and investments, the risks and the rewards are positively related to each other. So you expect, if you take a riskier investment position, to earn a higher return. And we certainly hope that that's what's going to happen. In the you know, sort of vocabulary of commercial real estate investing, first thing you have to think about is some definitions, property types. And if you think about commercial real estate and a big new office building on Brickell, that's going to be a core property. That's going to be the best market, the newest, the fanciest, the most expensive building to lease space in. And those buildings are probably owned by life insurance companies and pension funds, and they're not going to be there for the, the small direct investor. Core plus, nice properties a little farther away from the center, so Dadeland area here in South Florida. And those are also probably pretty dominated by institutional type investors. It's when you get to value add and opportunistic that you find more opportunities for individuals to invest along with developer entrepreneur types through the crowdfunding type source. And value add means a property that can be made better, can be made more profitable. So if you think of a shopping center that's you know five or 10 years old, it might have an anchor tenant that is moving out, so there's gonna be a big space open for a new tenant. Maybe the exterior needs to be spruced up, it needs better air conditioning systems, more energy efficient systems, that's value add. Somebody will buy that center, make it nicer, invest money in it, increase the rents, hopefully, and increase the value. Or opportunistic, that is essentially vacant land or property whose use is going to be changed. So there's a, a bagel store over here on US 1, and if you've lived here as long as I have, you look at it and you know it used to be a gas station. They didn't even take the concrete poles out, they just put a roof over them and put the outside tables out there. That was an opportunistic investment, 
because the use was completely changed. And that tends to be the riskiest investment because you're changing use, but it has the highest reward. The best source of decent returns for the, the smaller investor today is in value add and opportunistic. And the biggest demand in most major markets now is for industrial real estate, warehouses. So somebody tell me why warehouses are so popular now. Amazon. Amazon. And it's a very simple truth that a really, really successful industrial developer said in my class a year ago, and we all sat there open mouthed, yeah, is he said, a retailer has to store stuff. They have to store it. It takes up space. You can store it in $40 a square foot space in a mall, or you can store it in $15 a square foot space in a warehouse. Hello, it's not difficult, you know, store it in a warehouse and get somebody to deliver it. That's why industrial is so popular these days, and that's also why retail is sort of on the low end of popularity, because it is essentially expensive storage space, and people don't even want to carry stuff home from stores anymore. They want you to ship it to them. So I, I don't see that trend changing. The way direct investing works is through a limited partnership structure, where you will invest your money with a, a developer or an investor, and it will take him a year or two to actually place all that capital, him or her. Then it will take another three to five years for whatever plan they want to put in place to come to fruition and for the property to be sold and for you to get your returns back. So this is a long-term investment. Your liability will be limited to the amount of money that you contribute and the developer investor will have a structure something like this that for a million dollars in equity, about 100,000 of that will be the developer's own money, and another 900,000 will be sourced through crowdfunding or through limited partner investors. So 90% of the equity will come from outsiders and 10% will come from the actual general partner on the ground. And then to that million dollars, they'll add $2 million in debt. So you'll have $3 million to spend on properties, one or several. And the limited partners get a promised return, which these days for value add or opportunistic is probably about an annual rate of 10%. The general partner will get a management fee of one to 2% a year on the amount of assets invested. And at the end, when the properties have been disposed of, the general partner and the limited partners will split any excess return over that promised minimum for the limited partner. And that extra, which we hope is big, is called a promote. So in any documentation when you see promote, you know that's the split between the limited and the general partners. So why think about these investments? Commercial real estate is a hedge against inflation. Most commercial real estate has leases where the payments rise with inflation and at least some fixed expenses. So you get inflation protection over a long period of time with these investments. The returns are not completely correlated with stocks and bonds. So there is some diversification benefit that you know, helps with your overall risk return profile on your portfolio. And returns on value add tend to be about 4% to 6% above the long-term treasury. Opportunistic, you know, 8% and up above the 10-year treasury. So we're talking about significant return premiums in these investments. And it's possible to use leverage, you know, the debt to enhance the returns to the owners or to the investors. And we'll see what leverage does in just a minute. Also, if you invest through a taxable format, there's some tax benefits, depreciation, and amazingly enough, the, the change in corporate income tax that limits interest deductibility for corporations does not apply to real estate. Real estate is specifically exempted from that interest limitation. Now let's just look at treasury bonds, and you can see, looking over here on the right, that treasury rates are starting to rise. 
and I, most of what I see, people expect that that will continue. And the returns on commercial real estate should rise along with that. Also, inflation is rising back to a more normal rate, so as inflation rises, the idea that an investment with an inflation hedge should be of more interest to most investors. So let's look at a typical example of how returns might work in one of these direct investments. Has a million dollars in equity, two million dollars in debt, just three million dollars total, and there are projects, either a single building or a collection of buildings, that have projected net operating income of $180,000. Now, in this world, more jargon, we talk about something called a cap rate. That is the income yield that is expected. And to, to find the cap rate, you take the net operating income and you divide it by the project value. So here you take 180,000 and divide by 3 million and get a cap rate of 6%, which somebody would refer to as a 6 cap. If you borrow 2 million of the 3 million, that's 67%. That's the loan to value ratio. And let's assume you can borrow that or the investor can borrow that, the lead investor, at 5%. That means they're going to pay $100,000 in interest and they're going to have left $80,000 in before tax cash flow. But that $80,000 is the income return or the cash on cash yield on a million dollar investment. So the ownership piece of that is getting an 8% return in income terms and then the lender is getting five and the weighted average of those two averages out to the 6% cap rate. So that's just a little example of how leverage enhances an owner's returns. And that 8% beats the long-term treasury by a good bit. Now, it's not all perfect or else we'd all be flocking to invest in commercial real estate. There are significant transactions costs. You know, your general partner is gonna take one to 2% in a management fee and there's significant transactions costs in both acquiring and then selling the underlying investment property. So this is not the same as an index fund as far as costs. These investments are illiquid. If you invest in a limited partnership structure, you cannot get your money back until the end of the process, no matter how nicely you ask. So <laughs> you should know this. There is no partial withdrawal. There's no <coughs> early withdrawal unless you have a really nice general partner. And it's up to the general partner to decide when to dispose of the assets and pay back. You won't know how much your assets are worth and you won't know what your returns are until the process is done. Now on days when the stock market tanks, maybe it's not so bad to not know what your investment is worth instead of, to be, instead of being constantly confronted by that, but you really don't know how your investment is doing until the end of the process when the asset is sold. And prices are very volatile. Real estate has a lumpy supply. It takes a long time to do these projects. If you've renovated a bathroom, you know how long it takes to do some kind of real estate project. And what happens is that when demand goes up and prices go up, a whole bunch of new projects come on stream and they hit the market at different times and if too many come on, there's too much supply and prices drop for a while. So you get this underlying price volatility to be aware of. Now some other issues, and I meant for this to be November 2018, I'm thinking ahead. We are at the top of a cycle. I think everybody will agree that maybe you want to wait a year or so before you try this strategy. I actually have a friend who runs a fund and he had told his investors he wanted money in January. He has told them now, probably July at the earliest and maybe even December of next year before he's ready to even deploy capital because prices are so high. Rising interest rates is gonna bring more foreign capital into our bond markets and into our real estate markets here in South Florida. And that has a very specific impact on the U.S. economy that we'll take a look at in a second. So these rising interest rates will strengthen the dollar. That's going to make the dollar stronger 
relative to other currencies like the Canadian dollar or the European currencies who we compete with in a business sense. In the real estate market, a strong dollar is going to give the investors who are already invested here a boost in their returns. And when that happens, they tend to sell. They tend to recognize their returns and to go to some other market, which will put some downward pressure on our prices here. So a, a strong dollar has a specific impact in markets where you have a lot of foreign investment. Um, another sort of saying as far as South Florida goes, we have uh, in international finance, which I used to teach, we have a saying that says, you can always vacation in Naples. Now in some years, when the dollar is strong, we all go to Naples, Italy. <laughs> in other years, when the dollar is weak, we all go to Naples, Florida, and so do all the foreign tourists. So a weak dollar is very, very good for South Florida and for the other tourist gateways because it brings a whole lot of people in here from other countries, plus we stay home because we cannot afford to go to Europe. The prices are so high. So a strong dollar is, is not going to be great for South Florida. And it also hurts manufacturing in the United States because the prices of those products get high. So a, a strong dollar is another issue, particularly now, that may make you want to wait a while, so you know, a year or so, to try to take advantage of this strategy. And here, I meant to mention, these graphs are all from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. If you just Google Fred, you skip past Fredericks of Hollywood and <laughs> go to the Federal Reserve Economic Data Site at the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, and that's where all of these are collected from. They'll show you the treasury and the strong dollar and inflation and everything else. So the strong dollar is something to, to keep an eye on here. Um, decisions to make before you start. The ads are aggregators. Those are people that will funnel your money to real estate investors, and they tell you they have the best ones. Um, you, you pay them a fee. There's an implicit fee for that. It is also possible to go directly to the principal. And if you scroll down a little bit on the Google Doc, you can find them. Talk to them. Get their cell phone number so you can always talk to them. Somebody who doesn't answer your cell phone is not somebody, or doesn't answer your call, is not somebody that you want to deal with. Ask them what is their idea. A good deal has a very compelling story an out parcel, a change in the market, a new tenant, something that you think makes good sense. Look for markets, because you can do this all over the country, that have high population growth, like Florida, job growth, like we have, and low or no state income tax. Look for secondary markets. New York is expensive. Miami is expensive. Jacksonville, not so much. Um, Athens, Georgia, Austin, Texas used to be a secondary market. It's kind of getting expensive, but look for those markets because pricing and returns are a little better. And everybody loves the Vils. Nashville, Asheville, Louisville, <laughs> all of those, you know, sort of secondary cities in low tax but high population growth states. So that's where I'm seeing a lot of investment even by the big private equity funds is moving into those secondary markets. So those are my thoughts on direct investing in commercial real estate, and I'm happy to take questions if anybody has them. Yeah? What, what are your thoughts on global warming, rising water, and commercial <laughs> investment? And yeah, well, I, you know, I wish that we had an answer other than that somebody will figure it out. Um, I have heard lots of really, really smart people not have an answer to that question. But one thing that I, I do hear a lot is that this private equity structure has a maybe five to seven year horizon in any of these limited partnerships. And so the reason that the, the idea of global warming hasn't started to impact prices yet is because these funds figured that they'll be out well before their pricing at the end, at the back end, is going to be impacted. So, I mean, that's what I hear. We ask, 
and you know, quite frankly, we don't ask in a hugely public forum that's going to stop money from coming into South Florida, but I haven't heard a good answer yet, except that when the water rises high enough that you cannot get a cabin cruiser under the bridges of the Coral Gables Canal, then it's time to worry. So you can use that as a bell wrapper. Um, what do you mean by private? I don't know what you mean by private. Uh, oh, for something like this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I can talk briefly about investing in REITs. REITs pay out a significant percentage of their income, 90%, in dividends. So if you do not want those dividends, what you are getting is the tax burden of receiving dividends. And if you don't, you're just going to reinvest them. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, if and I, if you can avoid the tax, the REITs have a very, very short-term perspective because they have to generate dividend income and they are governed by security analysts. And they are governed by Wall Street analysts telling them what to do, which they find very frustrating. And there have been 10 or 12 acquisitions of REITs by private real estate investors because they think the value in the underlying property is much higher than what's reflected in the REIT share. So, you know, what they're doing is unbundling. They're just buying this. So, your REITs are good for people who need the cash, but if you don't need that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm very wary of ETFs because they are vulnerable to withdrawal demand, that they have to liquidate at the wrong time. You might as well just buy the underlying security. Dr. Hewson. Oh, hi. <laughs> it's Beth. Uh, I, I was recently knowing about the opportunity zones, and I think that might be something that, mm -hmm. that people would think is, is a good sort of additional layer to considerations to be had here. Would you mind telling people a little more about opportunity zones? Sure. Opportunity zones are something that I know I really have to brush up on, and it turns out that there's a blog but or a podcast, but it's not until next Tuesday, so I haven't seen it. Yet. What I know about Opportunity Zones is they are a vehicle for investors who have properties where they have generated significant gains to move those gains into investments in specific areas in specific cities that have not benefited from the economic growth in the, the city overall tax free. So it's a way to bring more investment money into underserved or underdeveloped areas in cities, and they are just now beginning to roll out where the opportunity zones are. I'm sure that we have some here in Miami, but it's a way to take the profits from one real estate investment and roll it over into another investment vehicle without paying taxes. Now, the benefit of that is that the money is going into a zone that really does need the investment and might not otherwise get it. So that's something I have to do more research on, but thank you. Oh, there you are. Thank you for asking. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sure. My name is Wendy Pierre. Hi, Wendy. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to know what's your insight, your feedback on the level of supply of housing in South Florida, meaning apartment and also condo units, and even single family. What I am seeing is that there has been a distinct slowdown in the higher priced units condos and single family, and the slowdown has really been in the rate of growth. And again, you know, we're, we're kind of at the top of the cycle here. In the, the smaller, or more lower priced condos, if I was going to buy anything to live in now, something for my son to live in, I would buy a condo in an older building in an area where there are new buildings going in place. So in Coconut Grove or on Brickle or on Miami Beach. The older buildings, you have a very good expense history. And it's especially nice if the roof has already been replaced because then you don't have to pay for that. Somebody else has already paid for that. And it's the expense history and the association dues that are, are so unplanned or unknown in a new building. And those are, are more affordable. What we need in Miami, and there are some new projects coming online, what we need is what's called you know, workforce housing, more affordable housing, and there are some new transit-oriented developments going up that hopefully will, will put 
you know, some sort of a dent in the demand for that more affordable housing because that's what we need without people having to, you know, drive for an hour and a half each way to get to work. And that's what I wish we had more of, but I do see that the, the plans in place and the projects under construction are, are geared toward that. And the other thing is that at one point the new tax law threatened to remove the low income housing tax credit financing and that removal did not happen. So the low income housing tax credit program is still with us. The credits are worth a little less because tax rates are lower, but we do still have that. So I'm happy about that. Thank you very much and I'll be around out here. Sorry. <laughs> So thank you so much to Dr. Yusun. Uh, just a reminder as we go to the coffee break that if you're attending the cookout, then please do get your tickets during the break. And then we'll meet back here in 15 minutes.